Well, it's a great pleasure to be here today, and uh, this is a title that I can use whenever I want to, Simple Algorithms Whose Analysis Isn't. Now, uh, Stephen asked me to talk about heaps, so this is really a talk about heaps. So if you read the abstract, there may have been a bit of false advertising, but let me um, begin by making a few general remarks. Computer science, even though it's been around for my lifetime, is still a young field. Uh, 50, 60, 70, 100, 150 years old, maybe. And uh, we as researchers often settle for the first solution to a problem, something that's good enough. But the first solution may not be the best solution, and the design space is incredibly rich in all these algorithmic problems, and it's getting richer because computers are so fast and uh, the storage space available keeps growing, and the more efficient computers are, the more space there is for algorithm designers to play in. Also, what people do in practice can be surprisingly simple. Uh, I think theoreticians somehow have a fascination with uh, complications and complexity. But what I try to do is uh, look at simple algorithms and design simple algorithms. And theory, to be relevant, should say something about why what people actually do does or doesn't work. And if we want our methods to be used in practice, they had better be simple. Otherwise, nobody is ever going to implement them. So uh, this is my personal research agenda to try to extract simplicity. And there are too many words on this slide. But uh, <laughs> look at fundamental problems. Try to understand and explore the design space, seeking what I'll call elegance. And here's a nice definition. The quality of neatness and ingenious simplicity in the solution of a problem, especially in science or mathematics. Keep the algorithm simple. Keep the design of the algorithm simple. Uh, the analysis can be complicated because the programmer doesn't have to worry about it as long as he or she believes it correct. And uh, study methods that can be used in practice. Now, there are some beautiful, simple algorithms that are surprisingly complicated to analyze, which is one of the things that makes this whole field interesting. This quote, or some variant of it, is usually attributed to Einstein. Make everything as simple as possible, but not simpler. OK. Now let's uh, look at the particular problem, data structure problem. Data structure. We've got some collection of objects or some structured information. We want to perform a sequence of operations on that set of objects or that information, access operations and update operations. A heap or a priority queue is just a set of items, each with an associated key, which we can think of as being a number, although it's anything that we can sort, anything that's totally ordered, and some associ information associated with item X. Okay, the keys are totally ordered and let's assume for simplicity there are no ties. The basic operations are we want to create a new empty data structure, we want to be able to insert elements into a heap, and we want to be able to delete the element of minimum key from the heap. This is sufficient to do lots of interesting things such as sorting. We can sort a set of items by sequentially inserting them into a heap and then removing them by repeatedly doing the delete min operation and they'll come out in sorted order. Um, we may be interested in other operations depending upon the application, such as finding the item of minimum key without actually removing it from the heap. Or we might be interested in putting two heaps together. I'll call that the meld operation, that's set union. Uh, and I'm thinking of this operation only in the situation where the two heaps that are being combined are item disjoint. Uh, things become more complicated if we allow items to be in more than one heap at a time, but I'm going to forbid that here. And here's an interesting operation, the decrease key operation. Given an item, 
replace its key by a smaller key, leaving it in its current heap. And finally, the arbitrary deletion operation, delete a given item from the heap containing it. Now, the last two operations, I'm assuming that I have direct access to the item X in its, in its position in the data structure where it happens to be. So we don't have to search for it, that's important. All right, so a heap is like a dictionary, but there's no access by key. We can only retrieve the item with minimum key, generally, unless we have a pointer directly to the item that we're interested in. We could keep a separate dictionary to allow us access to any item by key, but there are applications in which we don't need to do this. And I said this already, decrease key and delete. We're assuming we have a pointer directly to the position of the item in the data structure containing it, which we can maintain when we insert the item in the first place. Lots and lots of applications of this data structure, uh, priority-based scheduling, allocation, discrete event simulation, all kinds of network optimization problems, notably shortest paths, which is where the decrease key operation comes up, because when we're running Dijkstra's shortest path algorithm, um, it's a greedy algorithm, and we maintain for each vertex not yet reached the shortest distance that we've so far computed to the vertex. When we find a shorter distance, uh, we update that item, reducing its key. That's a decrease key operation. We can do a decrease key by doing an arbitrary deletion followed by a reinsertion, but as, as we'll see, we can uh, do better. And uh, computation of minimum spanning trees. Many minimum spanning tree algorithms use priority queues heaps. Okay. Now I'm going to assume that we're only uh, doing comparisons on keys. We're not doing any fancy bit twiddling. This means that uh, we can sort using a heap, as I pointed out, uh, and given the n log n lower bound for sorting, there has to be some operation that takes logarithmic time. Okay, if I do n operations, n insertions, followed by n delete mins, I can sort. Sorting takes at least n log n comparisons. Something has to take logarithmic time. So that's going to be our goal, to get logarithmic time per operation, but faster uh, for some of the operations, if we can speed things up. And indeed, we can get, uh, we can construct data structures where the only uh, operations that take logarithmic time are uh, delete min and delete and constant amortized time for all the other operations. That's insertion, melding two heaps together, and um, uh, decrease key. Now, by amortized time, I mean the total time of a sequence of operations divided by the number of operations. Or another way to put this is if I specify an amortized time bound per operation, then no matter what the sequence of operations is, if I add up the amortized times of all the operations, that sum is an upper bound on the total actual time of all the operations. So I can have individual long operations as long as they're compensated for by other short operations. Uh, faster, yes, I'll come back to this point at the end if I don't run out of time here. Now, so we're stuck with this log n bound. If we want a data structure that gives exact answers and we don't want to play some kind of uh, random access bit twiddling game, which is a perfectly valid thing to do, but there's another context in which we can maybe speed things up, but let me postpone discussing that. All right, now, uh, our design space for these heap implementations is going to be uh, trees, heap-ordered trees, but before I get to heap-ordered trees, let me just mention the obvious, which we can use a binary search tree to store a heap, or any kind of a search tree. 
Just keep the items in sorted order by key in some data structure like a binary search tree. Then every operation takes logarithmic time. Uh, except melding, to meld two binary search trees, that is a merge and that's expensive. So if you're in a situation where log time for all the operations is okay and there are no melds, a binary search tree is a reasonable implementation, but it's really over-organized. All we need is the ability to access the item of minimum key. We don't need to keep everything sorted in order to do that. And by exploiting that flexibility, uh, we can get some improvements. All right, so instead of keeping things in symmetric order in a tree structure, we'll keep things in heap order in a tree structure. That just means the minimum is sitting on the top in the root. And for any node, all the items in its children have bigger keys than it does. So things are, the big things are at the bottom, the small things are at the top. That's a heap order tree. Now the question is, what should the tree structure be and how do we implement the heap operations? And you will have seen a number of these data structures. And uh, I'll mention, I'm going to go through three of them. Um, the implicit heap, which goes back to Floyd and Williams in the late 50s, I guess, which is very fast, simple, small space, logarithmic worst case time for all the operations. And again, meld is problematic. I'll talk about this mostly for purposes of review. And then I'm going to look at pairing heaps, which is a self-adjusting data structure, very simple has good bounds, still some interesting open questions. And then I'm going to look at rank pairing heaps, which are a kind of heap that achieve the goal, which is to get logarithmic time just for the uh, delete min and delete operations and constant time for all the other operations. So uh, the heap order tree, the internal representation is we store one item per node in our tree arranged in heap order. So to find min, we just return the item in the root. To insert a new item, uh, we find a missing position at the bottom of the tree, stick the new item in there, and then we have to do a sift up or a bubble up process. If the item is too small, we swap it with its parent and keep swapping all the way up to the, the root. Delete min is the opposite. There are various ways to do this. We pull out the root, now we've got a hole. If we have a binary tree, we compare the two children, move the smaller child into the root, that creates a hole, compare its children, move the smaller child into the root, and so on until we get down to the bottom of the tree. Uh, and we'll do something more beyond that because I want to maintain a strong regularity uh, condition on what the tree looks like. Uh, decrease key is a sift up. It looks like an insertion. We change the key of an item that may make it smaller than its parent. We swap it with its parent if necessary and keep swapping until it rises to the correct level. Uh, an arbitrary deletion, we create a hole in the middle of the tree, then we have to do some combination of sift up and sift down to fix things, and I'll let you think about how to deal with that. Now, when we're doing um, insertion, we can choose what position at the bottom to add the new node in, and also in deletion, it turns out, we can choose the right, uh, choose the position where we want to add the item, and we'll take advantage of that in this data structure, which is essentially a perfect tree. Perfect binary tree with the nodes numbered level by level from left to right. And I want to stick something new in here, I stick it in the next available slot, which is number 10, which is sitting right here do my bubble up process. When I delete something from the top, the hole bubbles down and I lose some leaf off the bottom. I then take the 
item in the biggest node and swap it into the previous hole to fix the structure, make the structure re regular again, and then bubble back up if necessary. So here's insertion. I insert seven in here, and now it bubbles up two steps. And the deletion process, I delete five, and then there's a sifting up process that happens. So seven moves into the hole, then 21 moves into the hole, then 24 moves into the hole. And then I don't want the hole to be here, I want the hole to be there. So I swap 40 into the hole, and then I don't have to do any sifting up because 40 happens to be bigger than 24. Now, um, you may have seen this presented where the sift down process does a three-way comparison. So you end, actually, you do the swap at the beginning and then fix things up. But doing the swap at the end actually saves comparison. So this is not exactly standard, but it's basically the same idea. Now the nice thing about this data structure is it's very regular. I've got the nodes numbered here, and we don't need any pointers whatsoever to store this thing because we can compute based upon the number of the node what its children are and what its parent is. This is what is called a succinct data structure. Okay, the children of node V are 2V and 2V plus 1 and the parent of node V is V over 2 floor function. So we don't need any pointers at all. We just store the values, the keys, and if necessary, the associated inf information in the right slots in an array. This gives us, for example, a beautiful in-place sorting method called heap sort. Okay. So there is the array storing that heap. Now this is all undergraduate data structures, but uh, Let's just make a few observations here. First of all, MELD is painful because, especially if we're using the implicit representation, we have to do some array copying and it takes linear time, which is kind of ugly. So not a good structure if we want to have more than one heap and have the possibility of melding. On the other hand, insertion takes one times binary log n number of comparisons. And furthermore, it tends to be more like a constant because we insert a new item in the bottom. Uh, it's unlikely to bubble up very high. You can make some kind of average case analysis if you want to. Deletion takes two log n comparisons, but more likely one times binary log n plus a constant because again, the the uh, bubble up process to fill the hole takes one times log in comparisons and then when you do the swap and the bubbling up, uh, the thing is unlikely to rise very high. And if you are clever with the comparisons, you can reduce this constant factor of two to a plus log log in. So log log in worst case comparisons for an insertion, log in plus log log in worst case comparisons for deletion if you care about constant factors. This does not include the time for data movement. Also, um, there's no reason to make the tree binary. You can make it fixed degree for any degree D. And four-way seems to be the method of uh, the choice in practice. So this data structure with four-way branching is heavily used in implementations of Dijkstra's algorithm, for example. Okay, now what if we want to uh, do melding, and what if we want to do decrease key and get a good time bound? So, I'm gonna change the representation a little bit. We're still thinking of a heap order tree, but now I'm gonna think of a tournament in which the items start out in the leaves at the bottom of the tree. And then any pair of leaves run a tournament, the smaller one wins, so it moves to the parent. And so on all the way up. So the winner of the tournament, which is the smallest overall, ends up in the root of the tree. Everybody follows a path up until it loses to somebody smaller. Okay. 
Now, uh, this is maybe a little odd. The, the point I want to illustrate here is that um, there are many equivalent representations of this idea. We can start with this picture of things, and I'm going to go through some transformations to present it uh, in a different representation, but they're all equivalent. They're all equivalent, and that's the main point here. Now, the basic operation is this comparing two items and moving the smaller one into the parent. That's the same as taking two trees whose roots have the smallest items in them, hooking them together by creating a new root and copying the smaller item into the root. We'll call that a link operation. That takes constant time if we're using some kind of pointer representation. And now we have the capability of doing things like melding, because if I have two tournaments representing heaps and I want to put them together, I just create a new root and put the minimum from the two heaps in the root constant time rather than linear or anything like that. So uh, we're going to get to constant time melding using this idea after we go through some shenanigans here. Okay, so here's a picture. There. Now there's the question of exactly what tree structure do we use? Are we going to use perfect trees or something looser? We probably want some kind of balanced trees. If we're doing melding, we have to worry about combining big trees with small trees because the balance is going to get out of whack, and that's where the interesting part comes in. But before I do that, I want to go through some transformations of this representation because it's clearly redundant. Five, for example, appears in here multiple times. It's the winner. Seven is in here multiple times. Every item is in here uh, copied along a path until it loses to somebody smaller. I'll call this the full representation, which is where we start. Uh, now let's just erase all these repetitions. So we'll leave each item at the highest node it attained. So five stays in the root, and all the other fives go away. Seven stays as the, in the left child of five, and all the other sevens go away, and so on. We call this the half-full representation. And now uh, the root has something in it, exactly one child of every other node has something in it. And uh, now we can uh, symmetrize this thing by flipping all the full nodes to one side or the other. I flipped them to the left side, the left full representation. Okay, now we got all these empty nodes. This is the same data structure, just a different representation because heap order, left right symmetry, we're free to play with. Okay. Now I want to get rid of the empty nodes. So I'm going to give two more representations, both of which, again, are equivalent with no empty nodes in them, saving me essentially a factor of two in space. All right, so uh, this rightmost path here, this is a path up which five walked. It beat 10, it beat 27, it beat 16. So instead of having empty nodes here, I'm going to construct a list of nodes containing the items that five beat, uh, and seven was the last one. So the children of five are going to be seven, 16, 27, and 10 in that order. And the children of seven are going to be 21, 18, and 12 in that order. And here's the picture. This is a heap ordered tree representation, but it's really a compact version of a tournament. So this you may have seen if you've looked, seen uh, Fibonacci heaps or binomial cues or data structures of that kind. All right. Now, uh, as I said, we think of the children of each node as being ordered, although in this picture, they wouldn't necessarily need to be ordered. Uh, 
So this is an arbitrary deep order tree, right? The root contains the minimum item. Uh, all the children are larger than the item in the parent. Now one more step. It's not so easy to represent something like this in a computer because nodes can have arbitrary degree. So now we flip back to a binary tree representation. The binary tree representation of a forest is what Knuth calls this, where uh, each node has two pointers, a pointer to its first child, leftmost child, and a pointer to its next sibling. And if you can see the colors here, the dashed edges are the old ones and the solid edges are the new ones and the downward pointers are the left pointers and the horizontal pointers to the right are the right pointers and we end up with this picture. So this is a binary tree in which left and right are non-symmetric and the order here is what I'll call half order. For any node, everything in its left subtree is bigger. Okay, so, and the root has no right subtree. So five is bigger, five beat 10, 27, 16, seven, if we go back to the original representation. These are the nodes on this right, right path descending from its left child. Seven is bigger than everything in its left subtree, and so on. We can use either of these two representations, their equivalent. In this talk, I'm going to pretty much stick with this one now for the moment. All right. Now, that was a long-winded way of saying there are all these equivalent representations, and there are a lot of papers where people kind of reinvent one or another of these, but pick your favorite. Now, what are we going to do with this representation? Again, the basic operation is this linking idea. So how do we link two of these half trees? Uh, we just compare their roots and attach things appropriately. So 8 beats 10. 10 keeps its left subtree, and its right subtree is the old left subtree of 8. We know that 8 is smaller than everything. So this is preserving this half, half order property. The minimum is sitting in the root. If I want to do a delete min, I delete the eight. And now I have a tree, but I want to turn it into a half tree. I want to extract the minimum. That requires walking down the right path here and <coughs> comparing these items and figuring out the minimum. And that becomes the new root. Now I'm getting a bit ahead of myself. So um, to represent this data structure, we need left and right child pointers, and we might want parent pointers, especially if we're going to do arbitrary deletions and decrease keys, because then we're going to be going inside the structure, and we're going to have to follow paths going upward. So to find the minimum, we just return the item in the root. To make a heap, we return a new empty tree. To do an insertion, we create a new one node tree, link it with the existing tree. To meld, we link the two trees all constant time. All the work is going into the delete min operation. As I said, we uh, pull off the root and now we have to link all the subtrees that we get, one for each node on the old, on the right path descending from the left child of the old root and how we do the linking, that's where the subtlety comes in, all right? Now here's a simple heuristic which gives us a data structure called a pairing heap, which is a self-adjusting implementation of a heap. There's no explicit balance yet. This data structure just goes along. How it works is uh, when we do a delete min, we walk down this right path, we look at consecutive pairs of nodes along the path, compare each pair. 
So that has the number of uh, nodes we have to worry about. And then we start at the bottom. We take the winner of the pair at the bottom, compare that to the next one up, take the winner of that, compare it to the next one up, and so on until we put everything back together into a single, a single half tree. So here's a tiny example. We delete the five. We compare seven and 16 and seven wins and 27 and 10 and 10 wins. That gives us, so we delete the root, break all those links, that gives us four trees, four half trees that we have to put together. Seven and 16 go together, 27 and 10 go together. And that gives us two trees and then we just finish the job with the two of them. Now if we had more than one, more than two, We'd, pair, we'd uh, combine things bottom up. Now you can imagine other strategies like repeated pairing, but this particular strategy is something we can actually analyze, which is the way, the reason it's defined in this way. Okay, so that's the outcome, we hope. Now, uh, decrease key is very simple. If I want to decrease a key of an item in the middle of the tree, I just break it out as a half tree. I take it out along with its left subtree, replace it by its right subtree, decrease the key of that node, and then link it in with the top of the, tr the tree, also comes from top. Uh, and if I want to do an arbitrary deletion, I can decrease the key of the item to minus infinity, and then do a delete min on the minus infinity, and that will remove it. It's an elegant way to handle arbitrary deletion. All right, I've got a complete implementation here. It's very simple. There's no balance information. The tree just evolves as the operations proceed. Here's an illustration of decreasing the key of 18. So the first thing we do is we rip this tree out, with 18 along this left subtree. It gets replaced by the 12. I change the 18 to 11 and then link it back into the top. So that's the 18 tree ripped out, 18 replaced by 11, and now we compare 5 and 11, and 5 wins and 11 loses, and that's the outcome. All right. Now this data structure was invented by I and my colleagues uh, you know, mid-80s, I guess. And amazingly, even though there's no, it's, it's not good in the worst case, but it is good in the amortized sense, and it really does run in log time per operation. And uh, this pairing operation is designed in this way so that it looks just like what happens in self-adjusting surge trees and splay trees. It's like the pairing operation is like the zigzag step in splay trees, if you're familiar with that data structure, which is not important, but this just illustrates that um, sometimes these ideas transfer in places where you don't necessarily expect it to. So we can analyze this data structure using exactly the same method used to analyze self-adjusting surge trees, splay trees, the same potential function. Uh, here's another example of, yeah, I think I'll, this was deleting in. Now, I don't want to go through all the details, but let me just kind of sketch the idea. This data structure kind of automatically <coughs> self-balances itself, and we use a potential function that measures the imbalance, which we define in the following way. We give every node a weight of one, individual weight of one. We define the total weight of a node to be the number of nodes in its subtree. We define its potential to be the binary logarithm of that number. And the potential of the tree is the sum of the potentials of all the nodes. That potential has the property that the tree is long and skinny. The potential is high. If the tree is very balanced, the potential is low. What we want is that these paths that we have to traverse when we're doing delete min should be logarithmic in length. 
If that path, I mean, the time for a delete min is uh, proportional to the length of that right path where we have to pair things up. If that path is long, delete min is expensive. If that path is short, delete min is not expensive. Every time you get an unusually long path, the algorithm rebalances things in a way that shortens paths going into the future. And you can quantify that using this potential function, which is somehow related to the entropy. Now, there's some peculiarities here because this potential function, if you think about it, is invariant to mirror image flipping. Uh, a, a left heavy tree, on the other hand, is really good because it doesn't have long right paths. I mean, the stuff that's hanging down on the left, this is stuff that's totally ordered. It's the right paths where the, we don't know what the order is. So somehow this potential function is missing something, even though it succeeds in helping to analyze this data structure. Now, the data structure is very simple. I assert that this is an example of my title. This is a simple data structure whose analysis isn't. The first part is this is the part of the analysis that we know how to do that is reasonably OK. But now um, it only gives logarithmic time for each operation. You use this potential function and you grind through the details so that aren't too complicated and you end up with a logarithmic time for every single operation amortized. Not only delete, min, and delete, but also insert and also decrease key. But that's not, now remember our goal was trying to get constant time for insert and decrease key. And in this, and meld, in this data structure, those operations take constant time in the worst case, but not necessarily in the amortized case because this amortization process charges work that's done in the delete mins back against those other operations. But this potential function doesn't capture everything that's going on here because, in fact, this bound is not tight for a decreased key. And there's a bizarre gap between what's known and what's not known. Uh, Mike Fredman showed that for this data structure and for similar data structures of self-adjusting type that don't keep track of some kind of balance information, there's a lower bound of log log n on the time for decrease key. So uh, unlike search trees where self-adjustment, as far as we can tell, gives everything we might hope for, it does not in heaps. On the other hand, uh, this potential-based analysis is not tight. Seth Petty managed to prove this very strange bound of the amortized time per uh, decrease key operation with this data structure. Two to the two times square root of log log in. So this is uh, sub-logarithmic, super log log. And if one were to conjecture the answer just on the basis of simplicity, we're going to have to conjecture this. But <laughs> open, open problem. So we get a simple data structure with a not so simple but not horrible analysis with a gap and with a mysterious open question here. It's an example of which there are many where if you do a simple thing, but you do it repeatedly, you get to complicated behavior. Okay. So, um, using kind of self-adjusting ideas and amortization doesn't give us what we want. The inefficiency here has to do with the fact that we're not keeping track of the sizes of things. And if we link small things to big things, uh, we're wasting efficiency in our comparisons. So now I'm going to add some balance information to this data structure and uh, turn it into something that I'll call a rank parent heap, which is like a Fibonacci heap in that it has the same efficiency, but it's a little bit different in its 
Go to C here. Okay, so every node is going to have a rank, which is a non-negative integer which is something like the height of the node. It's sort of measuring path lengths. It's going to go up as we walk up in the tree. I'm going to give missing nodes a rank of minus 1 just for consistency purposes. Uh, and the root doesn't really have a rank, but I'll give it a rank anyway. The rank of the root is 1 plus the rank of the left child. And the rank of a tree is the rank of its root. Now. Uh, the rank is something like the height. The ideal situation, if I have a perfect tree, it would be a perfect tree with a, a, a root with no left subtree. Uh, the ranks exactly go up one at a time as you march up through the levels. It's exactly the height of the tree structure. Uh, so it's roughly the log of the size. And I'm going to use the ranks to decide when to do links. I'm only going to do links between nodes of the same rank. OK, so I store the ranks with the nodes. I only link two nodes with the same rank. And when I do that, the rank of the parent goes up by one. So this is preserving this property that as I go up in the tree, the rank goes up by one. That's how linking works. All right, now I can't maintain my data structure as a single tree. I have to maintain it as a set of trees because I might have trees with different ranks that I'm now not allowing myself to put together. I never need more than logarithmically many, but this is going to be an amortized efficient data structure, so in general there are going to be an arbitrary number of trees. But I'll keep a pointer to the root of the tree with smallest key so I can do fine min and constant time. So my data structure is now a collection of trees, which I will store in a circular singly linked list with a pointer where well, you can think of the first node on the list as being the one with minimum key. Uh, the circular singly linking is so that I can do melding in constant time. So here's a picture. If I want to do an insertion, I create a new single node tree. It's got rank zero. I just toss it into the pot. I compare its value with the current min, and it either it wins or it loses. In this case, five is um, bigger than four, so four is still the min root, and five goes in the second position. Insertion takes constant time. If I want to do melding, I just put two of these together, which takes constant time, and the new min root is the minimum of the two old min roots, like so. The circular linking allows me to tie these two things together with changing a constant number of pointers. Now, delete min again is the only non-trivial operation. Uh, I delete the min root. That makes the tree containing the min root fall apart again because we have to walk down its right path and get one tree per node on that right path. And now we take the entire collection of trees, the new ones that we got and the old ones that we had before, and we link them together as much as possible until we can't do it anymore. And then we put the remaining trees together into our new uh, heap. Right. So here I delete the zero. I got four old trees, and I now got one, two, three, four, five new trees. Those are the keys, those are not the ranks. And now I got to look at the ranks of these things and start combining things of equal ranks until I can't do it anymore. To do that, I use, here are the ranks, I use an array. I can do this with pointers, but it's easier to think about in terms of an array. I grab that tree of rank zero, throw it in the zero bucket, grab the tree of rank one, throw it in the one bucket, throw the two in the two bucket, throw the three in the three bucket, throw the four in the four bucket, throw the five in the five bucket, throw the three in the three bucket, there's already something there, I link them together. The result of the rank four tree goes in the four bucket. There's one there. 
they get linked, it goes in the five bucket, there's one there, they get linked, it goes in the six bucket, and then there's another three and two, and then they all get pulled out to produce the final outcome. Okay. Now the point here is that all the linking goes into the delete min. Every time I do a link, it takes me constant time, but it reduces the number of trees by one. So if I define the potential of a heap to be something like the number of trees, the links are all free, and I can then prove that all my operations take, uh, well, delete min takes logarithmic time, because I can prove that all the ranks never grow too much, they never get beyond logarithmic in size. And uh, insertion and meld also take constant time, both worst case and amortized. And now I want to look at max rank is logarithmic. Yeah. Now I want to look at um, decrease key. Right. This data structure is more or less equivalent to a lazy binomial Q if you're familiar with binomial Qs. What about decrease key? Well, uh, this data structure if you run it without decrease key, it turns out that all the trees have the best possible structure. They're in this perfect tree structure. But if we do a decrease key, we start ripping, ripping out pieces of these things, and we rapidly lose the structure, and we can no longer guarantee that the maximum rank is logarithmic. So that is the problem. Here, if I decrease the key of x, I ripped the x subtree out, and whereas the rank difference is walking along this path are one and one, now I ripped the x out and I got a rank difference two, and things are starting to get out of balance, and things get messy. Now, if you know the Fibonacci heap data structure, there's a mechanism in that to do selective pruning to keep things in balance. I'm going to do something similar in this data structure, but there's no pruning. There are no structural changes. All I'm going to do is, cha is change ranks. And kind of in an obvious way, I'm going to just decrease ranks when I rip something out of the middle of the structure. So uh, we're going to maintain an invariant on the rank differences. The ideal situation is where the ranks of both children of a node are exactly one less than the rank of a node. Uh, we're going to allow that case, we're going to allow some slight flexibility. We can have a node with a child of rank one and the other child of, uh, sorry, rank difference one and rank difference two. And we can also have a node with a child of the same rank, an arbitrary smaller rank on the other side. The rule was not important, except it happens to work. Uh, yeah, okay. So given a rule like this, what happens when we do a decrease key? We rip the thing out, it goes back up into the top. And from the position where we ripped it out, we walk up the path toward the parent, decreasing ranks if necessary to restore this invariant. So uh, we might have a 10-0 situation. That's allowed there. I rip out the 0, and I might have now 9-10. 9-10, I can restore that by decreasing the rank of this guy, make that into a 1-2. Decreasing the rank of the parent node causes its rank difference to grow, so I have to go up to the parent. This process cascades, walking back up the access path. But there are no structural changes here other than the one that I have to do to make the decrease key work in the first place. So here is an illustration. I'm going to decrease the key of x so this this subtree gets ripped out and I think these numbers are ranks. So this is a 0, 4 here. And the difference between 6 and 2 is 4, and that's valid. But once I rip this out, I got a 
difference between six and zero is six. I got a six four, but I can then reduce that six to a two, which makes that a zero two. But then that cascades up, upward. Okay, so I think that's the entire outcome. All right, so the, the six went down to a two, that six went down to a four, that seven went down to a six, and the process stops. All right, now, uh, again, a very simple data structure, and one can prove that this maintains the property that all the ranks stay logarithmic. They're now not one times the binary logarithm. They're uh, uh, log base golden ratio, so 1.44 times the binary logarithm. So you give up a constant factor on the height of these trees, uh, but you get the flexibility to do decrease key in constant time. And then you, you need to prove that this cascading process in the amortized sense doesn't cascade very often. The total time to do all these rank decreases over a long sequence of operations is constant per decrease key. And that analysis gets somewhat non-trivial. Again, a simple data structure whose analysis isn't. And this is even simpler than Fibonacci heaps in some ways, and it has similar efficiency, asymptotic efficiency. So at the moment, it's my favorite data structure of this form. People have invented at least half a dozen or a dozen different data structures to achieve the constant amortized time bound for decrease key, but this is the one I like the best at the moment. All right. And the rest of it is very much as I sketched before. When you want to do a delete min, again, you need the buckets to put things together, you put things together in a greedy fashion until you can't put things together anymore. All the work is happening in the winking in the delete min and a little bit in these rank decreases in the decrease key operation. Okay. And you can vary this data structure by playing with the rank invariant a little bit uh, you can either make it weaker, which makes it easier to analyze, but messes up the constant factors a little bit, or you can make it tighter, and then it becomes really hard to analyze, but it still works, and it's kind of amazing that it does. Uh, this is sort of a minimalist data structure, the type 1 rank pairing. Every node, either both of its children have rank one less than it, or one of its children has the same rank as it does, and the other child has arbitrarily small rank, rank less than it. Uh, yeah. Now I'm almost out of time, but let me just make a few more comments here. So. Remember, I asked this question about faster. How can we beat the sorting bound? Well, we can beat the sorting bound by using approximation. In this case, we can let our data structure make errors, which seems like a crazy thing to do. But Bernard Chazelle, one of my personal heroes, because he solved a lot of problems that I wanted to solve, uh, figured out a, an algorithm for finding minimum span increase based upon a heap data structure that he calls a soft heap that makes errors, but in a very controlled way. So if the thing is giving back bad answers, you can beat the sorting bound. And it turns out that if you allow the thing to make errors in a controlled way, you can actually plug it into an algorithm and compensate for the errors eventually and get this beautiful algorithm. And the data structure, I just want to say a few words about the data structure because it's kind of a nice idea. It goes back to the implicit heap, the binary tree where we store the values in the internal nodes, except instead of storing individual items in the internal nodes, over time 
we corrupt the keys of certain items so they end up moving around in groups instead of individually. In particular, when we do a delete min, instead of doing only a single sift up, we do a couple of sift ups and then the, the smaller key gets the key of the larger one that moves into the same place. But we do the double sift ups only at every other level in the tree structure. So this thing is, uh, the number of nodes here is growing by a factor of two at every level. The sift up process grows by a factor of two at every other level. So it's like the square root of two per level. So it, the sifting up process, instead of going up a single path, <coughs> is on this sparse tree that becomes a smaller and smaller fraction of this data structure. And let's see if I can illustrate this here. If I delete the five, I first move the 10 up. I move the 10 up and then I got to fill up that next node uh, which eats the 21. But then I do a double sift up at two levels down. So first the 24 moves in and then the 30 moves in as well. And I increase the key of the 24 to the key of the bigger one, the 30. So those guys are now spoiled. Bad keys. And not only that, this guy at the top, I only did a single sift up. So to finish this, I got to do a double sift up there too. So this time the 12 goes up and the 16 goes up from there. And then I think I'm done. Yeah, okay. So that's the idea. And uh, this doubling of size and the sift up at every other level is swamped by the doubling of the number of nodes at every level. You go through the analysis of this thing and you end up with a data structure where the delete min time is log of 1 over epsilon for an arbitrary epsilon. Or you have at most epsilon n bad items. You pick the epsilon. Now think of epsilon as a constant like 10%, 0.1. You got 10% bad items. You got a log of 10. Constant time for delete. Now, among other things, if you think about it, this will give you a data structure to compute the median, do selection problems in linear time, which was a challenge for a long time. But this, this data structure does it for you. And it also applies to this minimum spanning tree computation. And uh, an amazing thing about this minimum spanning tree algorithm that Chazelle came up with is if you change it slightly, this result is due to Petty and Robert Feynman. They managed to produce a variant of Chazelle's algorithm which is guaranteed to be optimum but they can't analyze it. <laughs> the reason it's guaranteed to be optimum is because it's a divide and conquer strategy that uh, breaks the problem down into tiny subproblems. And if you make the subproblems small enough, you've got enough time to compute an optimum algorithm for the subproblem size. So you compute all these optimum algorithms for tiny subproblems, do this recursive decomposition feed each of these tiny subproblems into the optimum algorithm and you put the whole thing together and you get an optimum solution. I mean, it minimizes the number of comparisons you have to do. But nobody knows how to get a good bound on it. So again, now that's a complicated algorithm whose analysis isn't or is. <laughs> complicated algorithm whose analysis is. All right, I hope I've given you some food for thought, and I'll be happy to try to answer questions if you have some. Thank you very much.